Hi, and welcome everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the Signified panel discussion. This is the e-commerce leaders on customer experience in a post-COVID world. My name is Brendan Cameron. I'm the strategic accounts director at AmericanEagle.com. I will be the moderator today, and I will be speaking with two fine gentlemen. Uh, I have Rob Harris, who is the uh, America's Fulfillment Operations Manager at Sonos, and Steve uh, Borelli, the CEO and founder at Cuts. So first off, I wanna thank you two gentlemen for being able to join us today. And to start things off, maybe we can have some quick introductions. Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit about the background, uh, just a, a little bit more information about your companies and, and kind of the current role you play. And uh, I'll pass it off right now to, to Rob to start us off. Yeah, thanks, uh, Brendan. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, my name is Rob Harris. I manage fulfillment operations for North America for Sonos. and uh, I've been at Sonos for about seven years now. I've worked my way through quite a few different positions at Sonos to get to the kind of position that I'm where I'm at right now. So I started at Sonos actually right out of college um, in a contract position actually for uh, within our e-commerce experience team. So e-commerce experience was inbound phone calls, inbound emails, uh, you know, handling customer service requests and things like that. And really our focus uh, was education for the customers and making sure that we can uh, provide our customers with all the education that they need to make an informed decision on purchasing Sonos. So uh, that's really my background at Sonos. That's where I started. So I really have a, a, a uh, an interest in the customer experience, making sure that our flows are right and that we uh, are, are providing our customers with the best experience possible when they're purchasing from Sonos.com. So from, from that original role at Sonos, I moved into uh, a, an operations role where I managed our fraud management program for, for a few years and, and worked into uh, growing our team, our sales operations team within our e-commerce department uh, as the company grew. Uh, and as the company grew, we had a, a much larger need for people focusing on what do our order flows look like? What do our payment flows look like? How are customers interacting with us uh, pre and post purchase? Um, things along that line. And then just as of the last year or so, I've moved into a more supply chain oriented role where we're focused on uh, fulfillment operations for all of North America. So that's our DTC business, um, as well as our B2B business with all of our biggest partners, the Best Buys, Amazons, Costco's of the world, and, and all of our other verticals that we sell through. So um, like I said, really excited to be here, really excited to talk about the customer experience and, uh, you know, get this going. Excellent. Excellent. And Steve, love to hear a little bit more about yourself and your company. Awesome. Well, pleasure to be here. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen Brelli, uh, founder and CEO over at Cuts Clothing. Uh, we are a premium men's apparel business, and we focus on outfitting the world's most ambitious people uh, with our clothing that fits the to and from active lifestyle of the modern uh, business professional. Um, we've been around since 2016. Um, experienced some, some uh, rapid growth over the last four years, specifically last year with COVID, and uh, happy to be here uh, to chat with you all about customer experience and um, stoked to be here with Rob as well. Excellent. Yeah, and a little bit of background to everyone. Uh, myself being the moderator, uh, we were able to gather these questions uh, in order to get some more insight on kind of the state of how e-commerce has been rolling around, any new practices or patterns that we've seen in the market, and some feedback that I'll have personally uh, coming from AmericanEagle.com. We're a digital agency that has about 550 employees that's been around since 1978. So uh, it's a lot of experience and, and we follow a lot of trends in market analysis. So we'll be adding a little bit of flavor to some of the notes here and some of the points and really just hoping to have a great conversation all around. So to start things off, uh, really just wanted to get some more information from Rob here. Uh, we know that the electronics industry was one vertical that really saw a lot of impressive growth during the pandemic. And we were just wondering, uh, what did the demand look like for Sonos last year? Was that following that same pattern we saw in the market or more or less? Yeah, absolutely. We we I would say we followed the market pretty pretty closely uh, from a demand standpoint during during the pandemic. It was really interesting at the beginning of the pandemic. None of us knew what how this was going to affect uh, the market, how this was going to affect demand, and so we really had to stay nimble on on making sure that we were staying on top of uh, 
our supply and, and having that come in and making sure, because I know everyone in the electronics industry has been dealing with the same issues recently. So the Sonos demand has been really good. We obviously saw a pretty major shift uh, from our, our uh, physical retail presence to our DTC presence during the, uh, during the pandemic as people were stuck at home and needing to purchase. But also at the same time, Sonos was a great product for the pandemic. You know, when people are working from home and when people are spending so much time at home, you know, I personally have been, you know, I go from my bedroom to my office, which is about 20 feet down the hallway here. And, and I spend a ton of time at home. And when I'm in between, you know, the, the barrage of zoom calls, it, it's, I like to, you know, have the music going and, you know, we're having more time spent in the house and it's a great time for Sonos to be used. So we definitely saw that demand uptick, like most uh, electronics companies did. And, and, and we've, uh, and it's been keeping it pretty, pretty busy on our side. Were there, were there any changes you may have made to your process internally, customer facing, just to make sure to help those customers and, and give them a good experience when, especially that change, it sounded like going direct to consumer. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, you know, the, our demand on Sonos.com increased drastically. Um, so with that came a pretty big increase in our customer contacts and what our teams had to handle internally at Sonos. And this was all while our teams were working uh, working from home as opposed to just being in the office together. So we really had to look at our processes when we saw the demand on Sonos.com increase as drastically as we did. And we really needed to um, focus on automation so that our customers, so that we could keep those phone lines, uh, you know, down to a minimal so we could focus on the customers that really needed that education and that, and those recommendations for products. We didn't want customers having to contact us for as often for post-purchase reasons, uh, you know, I think for us, one of the big things that we saw going into the, ho uh, you know, going pre-holidays, you know, because we saw the demand uptick prior to the holidays, but especially going into the holidays was a need for more self-service options for our customers, as opposed to having them contact us uh, for, for certain things. So we really use a lot of the data that's coming from our frontline teams and our frontline sales teams and our customer support teams to look at what's the low hanging fruit. What are the reasons that our customers are contacting us uh, for these post-purchase reasons. And we found, you know, for us, at least, there were two major categories. The first category being a customer requesting a return uh, and a customer requesting a cancellation on their order for anything, like they want to change the color or they decided they wanted a different product um, instead of, you know, maybe they wanted to upgrade from the Sonos 1 to the Sonos 5, uh, you know, for a little bit more sound in their home. So we really needed to focus on providing these customers with a self-service option for these two kind of main buckets. And, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time and my team specifically spent a lot of time working with our technical teams to, to provide these options for our customers. So those, those were two really big improvements that we had to make in the last year in order for us to number one, drive down the number of post post-purchase phone and email requests that our internal teams were having to deal with. And number two, provide that more seamless customer experience because we knew that the that with the demand increasing, the more customer service calls were going to be increasing. Our customers were going to have to sit on hold for longer. And that's something that we want to avoid. We want to provide provide that seamless experience for the customers so that that uh you know they leave that conversation with Sonos, whether it be something good like wanting to uh you know, having some questions about how to set up the best sound bar for their living room or the, you know, do they need the subwoofer for, for their, uh, um, you know, for their application to, you know, the customer not being happy with the product and wanting to set up a return. We want to provide that really high level of experience for the happy path and the sad path. Excellent. And I know uh, similar to, similar to that, you're, you're making that shift into the home office. You're, you're needing to look nice, but again, you know, you're at home, so you want to be comfortable as well. So I, I kind of want to shift this over to Stephen. Um, pretty much, uh, we know Cut prided itself on, on providing that high fashion, comfortable fabrics and, and clothing and that are made to essentially be worn day and night. So um, I'm, I'm assuming you guys probably saw a pretty good uptick as well in, in trying to get more, uh, having more customers come in, uh, really building your business in the past year. Did you see that kind of pattern emerge too? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, our our business uh, was comfortable um, clothing. It was never, you know, crazy, uh, you know, suits or things like this that kind of went out of style during COVID. We are our type of clothing really fit well with the way people were um, shopping. We 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 heard from lawyers and uh, other like suit wearing business professionals that they said, hey, you know, when um, before the pandemic, I always saw cuts, but there, I never really had a whole reason for it. I, ha I have to wear suits or dress shirts to work every day. And, 
And so, you know, maybe I had one shirt, but there was no reason for me to continue to, to, to shop with you guys. But now on Zoom calls, you guys, I, I could wear my boxers in one of your polos or a nice black t-shirt um, that looks nice and everything's a little bit more casual. And you guys have become, you know, our favorite, uh, our favorite uh, clothing to wear um, while, while on Zoom, uh, similar to this call. Um, you know, during the pandemic, the customer experience uh, was, you know, similar to what Rob mentioned, uh, you know, such a, um, uh, you know, a scale of a lot of things that happened, you know, early March when it went live, we had to extend our returns and really change up our returns process um, to fit, you know, you know, uh, the customers that, that were trying cuts for the first time. Um, and so the, the pandemic at the first week, we were like, okay, you know, a lot of these customers um, maybe lost their jobs or whatever. But at the same time, there was also a lot of customers that were used to buying shirts at Nordstrom and some of these other places that now were forced to buy, were forced to shop online. So even though there was less of our customers buying, there was way more cus customers for us to go get and to acquire. Um, so with that, it came a ton of different like styling advice, customer service uh, questions that we had to uh, overcome. And our customer service, a lot of the time became more than just where's my order. Um, I want to exchange to, uh, we had to get, you know, style related customer service reps to help with the shopping process. And that was something that we had to learn on the fly, but it's now a staple of our business to, to really help that customer in to bring that in-person um, shopping behavior online. And so, uh, you know, we have stylists now that you can shop and chat with when you're live to understand which fabric to choose or what colors or so on and so forth. Um, so that was one of the, the big items that I think we had to overcome. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're always focused on customer, uh, uh, how to increase our customer service. And, you know, we have a long way to go and it's something that every month we should have improvements. Yeah. And I think, I think it's very interesting that it, the the patterns that we've seen emerge seem to be you 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 got to take all of the benefits of being in a brick and mortar and transferring it into that virtual experience you know not being able to try on clothes or or having that assistant follow you around the store and make suggestions and and brand choices moving these things into that online customer service experience is is one of those important factors especially when you're in that direct to consumer market where you're dealing with people that are not the experts. You're, you're not dealing with the buyers and the purchasing agents. You're, you're dealing with somebody off the street, essentially. And having the opportunity to provide that exceptional service is, is going to get that brand loyalty, is going to get a lifelong customer instead of just that one-time purchase. Um, now, one of the challenges that comes aside that is, uh, let's talk about that stigma of online purchases that Pretty much every website owner knows about uh, fraud. Uh, Stephen, I, I, I want to start you off with the question. I mean, with that pandemic and and with having the virtual online experience, I mean, how are you making those steps to assure that there are no false orders, there are no stolen credit cards? You know, avoiding a lot of that that heartache that comes with, you know, getting these orders and then finding out they're not real. Mm -hmm. Well, um, before we used, you know, uh, one, we, we had a, we have a great experience with Signify. They've really helped with that. Um, maybe I'll talk a little bit about our experience before we had, uh, four or five different people on the team. I think it even got up to 10 people like dealing with the fraud or, uh, or, uh, false orders. Cause, um, it became a, a, a large, you know, as econ e e businesses grew, so did that fraud behavior. Um, and uh, one of my buddies who runs an uh, account for Black Friday didn't have a signified um, protection set up. And he thought his sales were inflated by like two or three million. And it was just a ton of people, uh, like this one uh, type of business setup that was, you know, just doing fraud uh, at scale, like, you know, full, full blown business that did fraud. Um, and, you know, it really hurt him from uh, not having, uh, uh, you know, inventory to customer service nightmares to understand, like his data got all messed up because he didn't understand how, how much revenue he actually had or what customers were real. And it just became like a Q4, which is a period of when you should experience a lot of growth and um, reward your customers. It just was a huge headache. Um, 
so you know thinking ahead was huge for for q4 uh for us we um you know with the shipping delays and uh the craziness of just getting people's orders on time and dealing with the ports i mean last year there was it seemed like one issue after another kept uh coming up but one of our big wins was we we ran an early black friday sale that launched this the last week in October, that was just a three day window. We didn't do any advertising. We just sent it to our most loyal customers and they all got their Black Friday order, you know, well before the shipping craziness happened. But then what we saw was a lot of those people that shopped on that early Black Friday sale ended up coming back for Black Friday. Um, and, you know, we, and we told everyone November 1st, hey, shipping's gonna be, you know, two weeks to a month. So if, you, if you're worried about gifting, get it now because it could take a while. Um, so we, we were transparent with our customers. Hey, a lot of this is out of our controls. You're going to have to, you, unfortunately, like the carriers aren't set up for this type of demand. Five years of um, growth happened in a couple months. So like the infrastructure just wasn't set up for it. So we, we had to overcome that. Um, we, you, we did have a, a few pop-ups around the US where we turned them into little mini distribution centers where we would send product to. And then customers in those local areas could pick up their order at those stores. So that was a little hack, although that didn't, wasn't crazy scale. It was only a few cities. Uh, it definitely, you know, helped for gifting periods, uh, you know, from Black Friday to Christmas. So that was some of the wins. And, uh, um, you know, it really, 2020, uh, we just learned how, you know, to act on your feet, be agile. Uh, there are so much, so many things that, um, um, happened where we, we thought one day our business was going to go under to the next day we we're going to have the best year we've ever had. So, um, you know, um, and, you know, being transparent with the customer, I think was the biggest lesson I, I had last year. Um, you know, you know, sometimes in years prior, we try to hide it or, you know, you know, decision, you know, this, you know, maybe not explaining the full reason why uh, frustration is happening, but, you know, last year our customers were understanding with delays and stuff like that. Excellent. And and Rob, I want to bounce it over to you as well. I kind of want to understand with, with that scaling you guys had to do and the automation that you tried to do it. Did you try to automate that fraud protection? Were there any processes in place? You know, kind of what roles went there? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we actually have historically used a rules-based fraud engine, um, you know, to manage our fraud where you have a certain percentage of orders that are accepted, a certain percentage of orders are, are rejected right off the bat. And then another percentage of the orders are going to go into a review queue for someone to manually look at and for those to manually be uh, either accepted or rejected. And I actually manage my team in-house looking at all of those reviewed orders. And historically, we've always been in the seven to 10% of our orders have gone into that review queue. But when you're talking about tens of thousands of orders, the amount of time that it takes to manually review these orders, it, it goes up pretty high. And, you know, we always like to manage that in-house because we knew, we know our customers best. We're the ones talking to them on a, on a day-to-day -day basis. We know what a good order looks like, and we're definitely going to know what a bad order looks like. And historically, that's always how we've managed our business. Um, Coming into the holidays last year, we launched our partnership with Signified to automate that entire review flow. So, uh, you know, the, the partnership that we have with Signified is anything that would normally go into that review queue is now sent over to Signified and Signified can action those orders, uh, you know, pretty much immediately. And, and it, it's been kind of a revelation for our business, you know, instead of having a team of three people who are spending three to four hours a day manually going through orders that those members of the team can be more focused on. Uh, you know, what are the other processes that we need to drive improvements on? How can we work with our internal technical teams to drive these improvements? And, it, and it's been huge for us, especially in the holidays when we saw like incredible growth. Um, you know, we would have been spending all of our time just manually reviewing fraudulent orders. And, and while I think that that's really important because it's important to know your customer, to know what good orders are looking like, um, it's really important for us to be able to free up that the time without actually having to just hire more and more people on a manual fraud team to, to go through those orders. So launching Signified, we launched Signified actually in, in October, um, just prior to the holiday season. And it was absolutely huge for us, not only on the, the reduction in time spent from my team internally, uh, but also from a conversion standpoint, you know, there's a lot of times, especially when you're a company like ours, a, a consumer electronics company that's highly sought after, we get targeted by these fraud rings pretty aggressively. And the internal teams at Sonos tend to get a little gun shy, uh, you know, when they when they get hit with those. We know when we get a charge back, there's going to be someone's name associated with it that they reviewed that order. So they tend to get a little gun shy on, on those things, which is, you know, totally understandable. And uh, 
really what we saw when we launched Signified is that we were able to increase our conversion as well, which which was major for us during the holidays. So uh, Signified was an absolutely huge help and fit right in with our strategy that we had over the last year is automate and and simplify the process for our customers. And, and you know, when we have, like I said, thousands of orders coming into a manual review queue and only three people looking at them, you're going to have a little bit of a delay on a lot of those orders. So bringing in Signified who can action these orders immediately and have those orders go out and, and really trust the decisions that are being made was huge for us. And, and like I said, fell right within our, our top priorities for the year. Excellent. And speaking of the holidays, uh, I think I might uh, bring in a little Christmas carol, you know, goes to Christmas past, present and future. So I'm going to hand off a couple of questions to you guys. First off, uh, what's one of those things that you learned, you know, looking back over the past year, what is one of those things to where if you could talk to yourself right before the pandemic happened, you would tell yourself to do differently or, or maybe tell yourself to put a bit more priority into? I'll let, I'll let Steven start. Last year, I would have said, uh, make sure nothing, no goods come in in Q4 because uh, we had huge delays Uh and we're actually still dealing with delays uh, at the ports that, uh, you know, you, you know, when you plan inventory to come into our, your business, you plan, you, you usually plan a two week to a month buffer. Uh, you know, we don't like to sit on inventory too long. We're, we're a, a startup business. We haven't taken outside funding. So, uh, you know, uh, you know, we, we like to sell, sell through things really quickly and not hold them too long. Um, but you know that didn't work in uh, last year. So th this year we 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 added like a two month buffer, uh, and that we we had to learn that the hard way. In, in May last year we 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 were pretty sold out of most of our items after like the big surge in April. Um, and one lesson actually I learned is we always have last month's rent right now um, is what we call it is an extra month of inventory that if if things really go uh, you know sideways you'll you'll be fine and so uh um, that was one of them the second thing is make sure you're sourced from a product standpoint in multiple geographical areas i think that was something we you know one of my mentors when i started getting into this business he would say that he's like you never know when something's going to happen to like your your source of of things um and sure enough COVID happened which is like a once in a hundred year thing um uh, and we, we luckily had that conversation. So we already had relationships built and it was an easier pivot, but um, you know, I wish we would have had more because all that trickles down to the customer. If all of a sudden we don't have black shirts, it's going to hurt our business significantly because our AOV is going to drop and then our cost acquisitions costs going to go up and then the, the tickets are going to go up. So then the people that just need quick answers don't get them. So one little thing can affect the customer journey in so many different ways. Um, and everything works together. I would say, um, you know, if you, um, you know, if you're starting a business right now and you're, uh, prioritizing things, just understand that things may affect, uh, different parts of the business in ways you wouldn't have anticipated. So, um, you know, I know the customer journey is not always a sexy thing, but I would hire your best guys on it. We just hired, uh, someone with like five, six, uh, years of experience. Um, I'm sorry, close to 10 years of experience just to manage that. Uh, for our business um, and uh, you know your customers are your lifeblood so make sure you're you're uh, treating them and really thinking about all the ways that they can be affected. Excellent. Rob what could you go back and change or, or tell yourself? Yeah definitely and I, I've spent many a holiday season uh, in the trenches at, a, in, at Sonos and our customer experience teams and on the phones talking to our customers and you know, that being just a standard rep and also managing a team who's doing that work. And I think like, if I were to look back and think like, man, three years ago, I really wish I would have thought, you know, some of these things I thought this year is just put more of a focus on these kind of customer self-service uh, improvements. It, it's so important to kind of weed out the low hanging fruit on, in these certain types of situations, weed out customers needing to cancel an order within 20 minutes of them placing an order, weed out, uh, you know, sending a customer a return label of, uh, you know, for a return that they need to make or an exchange that they need to make. It's, these are the big things that this year made such a huge difference for us in decreasing those phone calls so that all those calls that we took were qualified callers. These were call callers who were on the verge of purchasing Sonos. They were on the website. They were they had the, the products in their cart and maybe they just needed that one person to push them over the edge. That was really, you know, I really wish we would have started thinking about some of these things in the past. And it's really 
focusing on your focusing your team's energy on managing the systems, not managing each and pushing every order through the system. That's been absolutely huge for us, especially as the company scaled. So that's really been what I've thought about over the last, uh, you know, six months or so and stuff that if I would have done that three years ago, it would have been so much harder or, you know, life would have been so much easier for us during those, those crazy holiday seasons. And, uh, you know, I, this year, even though we saw the, the largest growth in our Sonos uh, e-commerce um, sales, you know, through the holidays, I actually found it to be the most stress-free holiday season that we've had in part because, you know, the automation that we were able to do with Signified, the automation we were able to do with those two pieces, it felt like the least stressful holiday we've had in years, even though our growth was higher than it's ever been. So um, I think that those pieces are super, super important for any organization, uh, you know, that's that goes through a really cyclical uh, sales cycle, like kind of like Sonos, where, you know, we do great sales during the year, but then during the holidays, it goes crazy. Really think about, you know, looking at that data that says these are why customers are contacting us and, and trying to find solutions for those those problems and you know using your time during the non-holiday season to really focus on on that customer journey and those customer flows and and where the customer hangups are and how the customers go down that sad path and really be able to focus on uh, driving some fixes to those so that during the holidays you can really you know drive home all, all the revenue that you want to drive home. Excellent. And I'll keep it with you, Rob, the time to move into the present. Is there anything you could share with us? Um, what your priorities might be for the, the rest of the year? What your, any roadmap items that you want to share? Yeah, absolutely. I think just driving efficiencies for our customers. And really, like I said, I manage our fulfillment operations. So I'm working really closely with our carriers and our warehouse on making sure that our products are getting shipped out as, as efficiently as possible. Um, and so one thing we're really focusing on is just that, that customer, um, shipping journey and like how long it takes to ship to our customers and potentially opening more warehouses in the U S to, to optimize, um, how quickly we can ship to our customers because all customers now are so used to the Amazon model and the prime model where they can get their stuff in two days. And it's, it's really quick, maybe not during the holidays. If you're trying to, you know, buy masks or sanitizer or toilet paper, that was taken longer than two days, but, uh, but in general, we really want to be able to compete with the Amazons of the world with, within our e-commerce business. And that means making sure that we've got the right shipping uh, options for our customers and that we're shipping our stuff to our customers as fast as, as humanly possible. So that's really uh, one of our focuses this year. Um, and, you know, the other focuses are just on the supply side of the business. It, it's really important for us to stay on top of these things. Like Stephen said, the, the, the delays at the ports that we're seeing right now microchip shortages, you know, making sure that we're sit setting the right expectations for our customers as to when they're going to receive their products, because you know, we're on back order on, on a good chunk of our products on our website right now. And, and we're really just focusing on that customer experience. And it's something that we've never had to deal with before. And we've had to be nimble and pivot on. So really focusing on providing the best uh, experience for our customers, even though we're, we're not able to get them their products uh, immediately is, is really where the focus is and making sure that going into the holidays, we're as prepared as possible. And Stephen, what do you think? What, what's on your roadmap for the for the rest of the year, maybe? Yeah, absolutely. Well, one thing, Rob, I would like to say, I love, I'm going to steal it from you, is manage the systems. Um, you know, I think that it, going on to this question is, uh, you know, uh, our team is much smaller than Sonos, but we went from nine to 30 employees. We're going to go from 30 to 50 to 60 this year. Um so um, my main uh, responsibility and just for the team is just manage this, build, build, because, you know, we still have to build a lot of systems, but manage the systems and find efficiencies within those systems for our customers. Um, and, you know, when it came to customer service, breaking down the customer service reps deal with specific issues, that was, uh, I'm sure, Rob, you think that's uh, JV, but to us, that, that was a huge fix uh, for the amount of tickets and how quickly we could answer uh, customer uh, responses uh, on the product level, continue to push the envelope. Uh, one of the things that we've had a lot of success with is Friday projects. We release 55 new products uh, um, a year or uh, every Friday we launch a new product and that's been a huge success of ours. It brings freshness. It, it gives customers a reason to check our site every week and it's been a huge uh, LTV uh, lifetime value uh, increase for us. Um, and uh, I, I would say, you know, the last thing is uh, continue to just focus on our community. We have uh, ambassadors, we have a VIP community, uh, we have macro uh, influencers that inspire our, our customers and our community is really our lifeblood. So, uh, you know, really listening to them. I think last year we, 
we did a great job of really listening for the first time. And, uh, you know, we want to be able to make the products that the customers want us to make, deal with the issues that they deal with and inspire them to, to crush their life and, and their business journey. So that's kind of what you want to focus on. Excellent. And I'm sure we could probably talk for another hour or two, but unfortunately we're out of time. Uh, I do want to thank you, Rob. Thank you, Stephen, for the time you put in today. Uh, definitely, if there are any questions for any three of us, please feel free to get in contact with us. We're all on LinkedIn. Uh, we'll have our information right here on the screen right now. Uh, if there are any general questions, specifics, or, or you're just looking to maybe get some insights on what we've gone through in the past and how you could plan for your future, we're absolutely available and happy to help. So thank you very much, everyone, for your time. And we'll talk again soon. Thanks, guys.